Welcome, everyone, to the U.S. Institute of Peace. My name is Robin Wright. I'm a senior fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace, specializing in issues involving the Middle East, Islamic extremism, and many of the conflicts that have haunted the region. I'm joined this morning by Ili Abu Aoun, who is director of the Institute's Middle East and North Africa programs, and Mona Yakubian, who is a senior policy scholar specializing in Syria at the Institute. We're going to talk this morning about the challenges at this critical turning point in the fate of the Islamic State. It is under pressure in both Iraq and Syria. One of the big questions is, what happens to ISIS? How does it evolve as it loses its caliphate? And what happens in Iraq and Syria? The Islamic State at one point at its height held a third of the country in territory in both countries, uh, roughly the size of the state of Indiana or the country of Jordan. Uh, my initial thoughts to open up our conversation this morning is that uh, it's quite possible that the U.S.-led coalition and other parties will defeat the, the Islamic State. It will take back the caliphate, the territory, but that the ISIS is far from finished. And the grave danger, of course, is if there isn't the kind of policy in place, the solutions developed by both countries, both of them facing uh, conflict, long-standing conflicts, that we could beat ISIS but still lose the war, still not make the peace. Uh, we also have the broader problem of what happens to the ISIS fighters. There are 50,000 foreign fighters who have joined the Islamic State and other extremist movements in Iraq and Syria. Uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of them have already returned home. In Britain, it's actually almost 50 percent. And of course, as we've already seen, ISIS is not just confined to the Middle East today. It is a global movement. It stretches from attacks in Europe uh, to the Philippines to Florida and California. So this is a pivotal moment. My great concern, uh, to start off our conversation, is that the government in Iraq, just as it's taken back most of Mosul, really doesn't have a plan in place for governance. It's got a plan for security, but the question is, how does it make a community, widely diverse community in Mosul, feel that they are represented, that their interests, their future, their livelihoods, their security, are protected. And that's, I think, the government has to a lot of convincing to do. Fourteen years after the U.S. intervention in Iraq, we still don't have a plan for power sharing nationally. And of course, Mosul is now a microcosm of that challenge. And so the fate of Mosul will in many ways decide um, the future of Iraq. And then in Syria, you have a, 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 an array of wars playing out that are internal, are regional, and also pit the major powers, the United States and Russia, against each other. It has a sectarian component, uh, Shiite versus Sunni. It has the regional component of different players, whether it's the Gulf states uh, supporting some of the rebel movements, Iran supporting the government of President Assad. So this is a, a, a time that there's still a lot of sorting out to do, even as we feel much more confident about fighting, finally defeating the world's most virulent extremist movement. So let me get your thoughts. Let me begin with you, Ely. What, do you, what strikes you as most important for us to understand about this turning point? Well, the most important thing is to assess uh, the threat of the jihadi movement in the region uh, in, in, in its right size. Uh, ISIS is only the last iteration of a, of a, of a movement that started a few centuries ago. And the region has been living with, with this ideology for, for the last decades, uh, specifically in the last decade, but as I said, for the last century. Uh, so ISIS as an organization, as a caliphate, as you mentioned, will probably be defeated in the next few weeks. Mosul is not the last city. They still hold Tal Afar. They still hold Hawija and other cities in Iraq. So, but anyway, they will be defeated militarily. Uh, there, there seems to be no doubt about this. But uh, the ideology of ISIS will, will not disappear. On the contrary, what we know from our field observation is that 
the radicalization and the ideology is increasing actually in Iraq, in Syria, but also in other places. Uh, so uh, what we need to think really is how to address the drivers of this radicalization. And what I wanted to say about this is that uh, also based on our experience on the ground, the drivers are different from one town to, to another town in the same country. Mm -hmm. So having one generic analysis and approach about radicalization is also another mistake. That's actually, let me follow up on that a little bit because I think that's a really interesting point. When you talk about the drivers, what is it that has produced this extremism and that as it evolves becomes ever more ambitious, aggressive, angry, um, and deadly? Again, what drives this radicalization is, is different. There is a wide, wide array of, of reasons why people uh, get radicalized. Uh, so the most common reasons that are uh, mentioned in almost every study are political grievances, social and economic exclusion, lack of appropriate education, religious discourse, etc. So I don't want to repeat them. These are the, uh, the, the ones that are uh, uh, commonly mentioned as the drivers of radicalization. But uh, we need to dig deeper than this and understand in each city, each town, how, how is it happening and why is it happening. Uh, recently, uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, through its uh, national partner, Senate for Peace Building in Iraq, handed over a CVE, a countering violent extremism strategy for the Anbar province to the Iraqi authorities. And this, uh, this exercise made us realize how much the uh, analysis needs to be local and the solutions need to be local. Mona, you spent part of your life uh, working at the State Department and at USAID. Uh, when you look at what lies ahead, what do you think are the things the United States can do outside of our military power? in creating an alternative? Well, I think, actually, the, the campaign against ISIL will not be won militarily. It really is going to come down to what happens in these areas that have been liberated from ISIL after the military campaign has been won. This is where I think uh, the State Department, USAID, and other international actors have a critical role to play. Uh, beyond ensuring that security is provided for citizens so that they can return, are there basic services that have been restored? What about governance? Are people's aspirations being addressed by local governance structures? Um, in the absence of those things, we really create the fertile, fertile ground for a reemergence of ISIS 2.0. Mm -hmm. We did a report at the US Institute of Peace uh, bringing together 20 scholars on extremist movements and found that with each generation, uh, the, the, the time to mobilize or what or swarm, which is the official term, is cut in half. That the, to recruit and get people into a, a battlefield takes half the time. That uh, with each generation, you have a wider cross-section, a wider array of countries represented. That the agenda becomes much more ambitious. Uh, again, creating a caliphate. You think of this movement, which really the current round has its origins of the 1970s with the failure of the 1973 war, the, <clears throat> the reaction to the Soviet in intervention or invasion of Afghanistan, the 1979 uh, Iranian Revolution. And, uh, and we have seen them become, the, the movements become in some ways uh, more absolutist, um, more difficult to create alternatives, to counter the narrative. And I think one thing that's so striking is that uh, we haven't yet figured out a way to counter that narrative effectively. I, you know, I think you're absolutely right. I think the role of social media and other things has amplified and perhaps accelerated these drivers. But I think Elise's point bears repeating, which is it's really local conditions on the ground that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, and as he rightly points out, each, each city, each town differs one from the other. I think in Syria, in Raqqa, um, we have a particular set of concerns, which is that the main force that's going to be taking the town is Kurdish dominated, but it's essentially an Arab city. So how are we going to mediate these interests? Who is actually going to be calling the shots in terms of governance issues? Um, if Kurds are dominating uh, the governance structures of an Arab majority city, I think that's setting up uh, a conflict down the road. Uh, we welcome your questions and we have the first one.
Uh, the U.S. has shown it will continue to work with the Kurds in the war against ISIS, but the independence referendum does not sit well with some ethnic and religious minorities in the region. How do you think the U.S. will proceed? Uh, we should note that they're referring to uh, the Kurdish president's call for an independence referendum on September 25th this year, uh, the culmination of a long campaign to decide whether the Kurds want to be part of Iraq or want to go off uh, on their own. The Kurds, the largest minority in the world without a state. Ely, do you have some thoughts on that? I mean, uh, not necessarily on the U.S., but what I would say is that uh, uh, the U.S., as any other international power, they, need, they, know, they, they know how to pick and choose uh, what to do and what to, not to do with regional or, or local forces. Uh, and I think the same approach will be used with the Kurds. So I, I, don't, see, I don't see the collaboration on, uh, on the war against ISIS being severely affected by, by the independence. And the other point I want to add on the independence, that yes, the Kurdish leadership declared September 25th to hold the referendum, and uh, I think it will be held on that date. But the, uh, implementing the decisions or the outcomes mm -hmm. of the referendum will take some time. So it's not something that will happen overnight. It requires some time to negotiate with the central government how, uh, how to proceed uh, based on the outcomes of the referendum. Yeah, and I suspect the United States and the United Nations have both said that they do not support the idea of Kurdish independence at the, at the moment. Uh, and I think what the Kurds may be doing is trying to figure out uh, to to broker a different kind of power sharing agreement with Baghdad during a transition uh, period. They've had tensions over issues of oil revenues, over uh, power sharing, and this is a way to give them more leverage in that argument uh, on the path to eventual uh, independence. But of course, Kurds becoming independent of Iraq opens up then the issue of what happens to the Kurds in Syria and Iran and particularly Turkey. Um, do we have another question? Well, l let's talk a little bit about uh, Mosul. I was there in March, and this is a place where uh, the country really reflects all its vulnerabilities. There's no electricity. The US bombed all the major intersections in order to prevent the, 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 the suicide bombers from attacking uh, Iraqi troops trying to liberate the city. And that's made aid difficult. It made, it's made difficult for families who may want to go back uh, to reclaim their property. The university was destroyed. This is one of the oldest libraries with documents dating back more than a millennia. That the institutions have been destroyed, not just the, the walls of, of buildings. Uh, Ely, you were in Iraq recently as well. Do you have thoughts about uh, what it's going to take to create an Iraq that is viable and not vulnerable to extremist ideologies, to kind of the, the forces that have eroded the national identity or the national fabric of the country. I think uh, this is a two hours discussion by itself, <laughs> but in a, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, I think what Mona referred to as the lack of, a, of an appropriate governance framework is, is very relevant in the Iraqi case. I don't think it's, it's uh, realistic to expect some sorts of stability in Iraq without uh, having the Iraqis agree on a governance, on a power sharing agreement, on a governance framework that would prevent further political exclusion, that would uh, give guarantees to all the constituents of Iraq that they can live in safety and dignity in their own country. Uh, and in Iraq and in many countries in the region, personally, I don't see any viable uh, model that is not based on a federal, confederal, largely decentralized model. I think these are, uh, this is the pattern in the region, uh, in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in Yemen, uh, in, and probably in other places. So uh, the effort to uh, highlight or emphasize one national identity and uh, the nation state model based on the European uh, or some European model, not all of them, but uh, I think is, uh, is a waste of time at this stage in the region. We need to think creatively out of the box. We need to figure out governance models that are appropriate to the reality of the region. And today's reality is that 
because of all what happened, all the conflicts, all the exclusion that happened, the dict dictatorships, etc., people don't feel that they belong to nations, they feel yeah. they belong to communities. Yeah, exactly. And this is something that needs to be addressed, at least in the short term, through an appropriate uh, governance model in Iraq, in Syria, etc. And then later on, on a voluntary basis, communities might reunite in one country and more than one country, but this has to be a voluntary movement, not a forced thing uh, by the international community. Could I just jump in on this? Because I think this idea of decentralized governance is really a critical one to hammer home. I think, you know, Ali rightly points out, in places with diverse populations like Iraq, like Syria, um, the irony is it's really going to be a very highly decentralized Iraq or decentralized Syria that allows these countries, these nation states, to actually stay together. And if we don't understand that, I think we are really setting ourselves up for more conflict down the road. You know, the one question also is that we've seen the movement of peoples inside countries, noted particularly in Syria, whether and between the death toll, but also the d displaced people, communities, the, the effectively ethnic cleansing going on um, by a lot of forces, not just the government. That is there the danger that, that the demographic distribution of countries changes. Syria was a wonderful melting pot, uh, and it is the geostrategic center of the Middle East. And it was a model. I've been, I've spent Easter in Damascus, where they have chocolate Easter bunnies and colored eggs, and they honor both the Orthodox and the Catholic holidays. So that there is, you know, there is a sense that it may be a predominantly Muslim country, but there are others, other faiths, whose rights and and holidays they honor as well. Is that spirit, has that evaporated? Is there, because the danger strikes me is so yeah. much more profound in Syria in terms of how do you bring those communities back together? It's very hard to see how they volunteer with a death toll of half a million people with two thirds of the country dependent on international aid for their daily bread. Well, I think you frame it exactly right. I mean, the displacement issue in Syria is significant. Half the country's population has been displaced. Half outside, nearly more than five million refugees outside, and about six million people internally displaced. Um, Out of a country of about 22 million. Exactly. And, and you're, you are exactly right. There's real, I think, legitimate fear that new facts are being created on the ground. New demographic realities are being created mm -hmm. on the ground. And I think there's a lot of concern that the Syria, cer certainly the Syria that you knew and I knew uh, as a Fulbright student there, that Syria, I think, is gone. Um, the question is what is, uh, what is the model to look for going forward to, um, to build a new Syria, again, a highly decentralized Syria? As difficult as Iraq is, Syria is exponentially more complicated. Yes. We are trying to do all of these things in the absence of a political settlement. Mm -hmm. um, that said, as the country begins to stabilize, as conflict starts to recede from areas, we are actually seeing people return. The UN has recently announced 400,000 Syrians have returned to the country. But will they stay? Mm -hmm. And what Syria are they returning to? Mm -hmm. My sense is that many of them are going back to see whether their houses are destroyed, to get a sense of the state of the play. It's the men going home, or men and, and their sons, uh, the w women and other children staying uh, outside the country. We have another question. Uh, from the perspective of peace builders, what does the average Iraqi citizen face after ISIS? What are the major barriers to peace? And what peace building initiatives might work, especially in places like Mosul? Ely, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, peace building in places like Mosul has many layers. Uh, I think the, the immediate, the short term concern is, uh, uh, is uh, to prevent uh, revenge uh, operations uh, against some civilians or some groups, tribes, etc. Et and the second one is to work on deconfliction mechanisms for local conflicts. Uh, this, this is what we think should be done in the, in the immediate future. Now, thinking on a, mo on a longer term, uh, we mentioned the issue of the barriers to return. So what would prevent IDPs from returning? And this takes us into the reconstruction aspect, uh, the security, security provision aspect, and the governance model. So these are uh, 
the main aspects that uh, peace building need to be thinking about in, in the case of Mosul, but also in other places in Iraq. If I could just yeah. add on this, I think uh, Ilya is exactly right. I think there's another issue, which is places like Mosul and Raqqa, populations have lived under ISIS control for three years in some instances. Um, there are real concerns about who constitutes an ISIS sympathizer or not, and how are these people going to be treated? So I think there are real legitimate concerns about tensions not only between various sectarian communities, but even within the Sunni community. Um, and and uh, there, I think, local level reconciliation efforts and dialogue is going to be essential. And some sense of understanding that people were living under ISIS not by choice in most instances. Um, how, we need to think really uh, creatively about how to ensure families and others are integrated back into the social mm -hmm. fabric of their community. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important point. We, we look at the Iraq experiment after Saddam Hussein's ouster, and there were so many people who had worked, uh, were members of the Ba'ath Party, or had uh, worked under some kind of official, had joined because they needed a job, basically. Exactly. And you couldn't be a kindergarten teacher or a garbage collector if, unless you were a member of the party, or rise from those positions. And of course, I think everyone, history looks back and thinks one of the classic US mistakes was disbanding uh, the Ba'ath Party and the military. And so we have to be, I think, very careful. It's the same thing with the Soviet Union, where everyone had to be, you know, to get a, a decent job, had to be a card-carrying member of, of the party. And, and the critical question of how you differentiate between uh, the really bad boys, the ideologues, mm -hmm. the operatives, and and those who were just trapped by realities needed to provide bread for their families, um, and those were the the only jobs around. I mean, one other thing that concerns me is when, having spent my whole life covering wars, is that as wars progress and kind of take a hold of society, you find that the economy is warped or corrupted yeah. by. Um, the war economies, the smuggling, and so forth, that the warlords, the, the military figures, the militia leaders, become powers in their own right with their with economic uh, control of certain businesses. And that's, it's, it, ending a war is not just ending the firing of guns. It's actually undoing all the damage, the, in, the, the new infrastructure, the new realities that have been created in the meantime. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, given the completion of the Ilisu Dam in Turkey that will reduce the water flowing into Iraq via the Tigris and the effects of climate change, what role do you think water insecurity will play in, or in exacerbating conflict in the region? Who'd like to take that one? I'll, I'll say one thing that comes to mind immediately, which is there are some, some people have looked at the Syrian conflict and have said that water insecurity, climate change, and drought uh, in Syria. They had a, a record uh, drought in the years prior to the outbreak of the conflict. That that was a contributing factor mm -hmm. to the eventual uprising. Of course, many other factors at play. But I do think it's important to understand and drill much down more deeply into the role of climate change, water insecurity, and other things as drivers for conflict. I think the same thing's true in Yemen. There's a, a, a sense that the conflict in Yemen was uh, fueled in part by some of the environmental uh, factors. And one thing that struck me, and I did a piece recently uh, for The New Yorker on this, that the lights are going out in the Middle East, that electricity is a basic problem. Whether it's in Gaza, where you have one or two hours a day. In Libya, they have gone weeks, the whole country, without any power at all. Uh, in parts of uh, Iraq, which is an oil-rich country. You, in all of Iraq. In, in all of Iraq. In all of Iraq, not just in Mosul. You're down to eight or nine hours of, of power a day for a lot of complicated reasons. Uh, but this is one that prevent, that affects the level of education. Kids can't, you know, they're, they're not light to study by at night. They're not computers to do research. Um, that it affects businesses. In some places, the government does not announce where, what hours l the lights are going to be on or the electricity is going to be available. Uh, and when they do turn on, people get up in the middle of the night to do 
groggily to do their laundry or to do business deals because they've got access to their computers. That we we forget that some of that the that the challenges in the region are not just the ones of conflict. It's all the things, environmental issues, the electricity, the infrastructure deterioration, uh, that really are taking the whole region back in time. And that when it comes to finding solutions for some of these problems, you really, uh, the scope is almost unparalleled uh, for conflict zones where we're seeing the array of conflicts, the fact that borders could even be re redrawn because of the, um, the deterioration of that national identity. It's a tough time. Um, we have one last question. Uh, after ISIS is defeated in Mosul and Raqqa, what will be or should be the top priorities for the United States? I'll say, uh, sorry, I'll say very quickly, certainly in Raqqa, the top priority really needs to be stabilizing Raqqa and beginning to drill down on this very difficult issue of governance and ensuring that the people of Raqqa have a strong say in their futures. One of the things that's so striking is that Mosul will return to Iraqi sovereignty. We know that. The government is the army moving in against ISIS. In Syria, you have different armies moving in on Raqqa, as you pointed out, whether it's the Kurdish-dominated force moving on an Arab city, but you also have others that want Raqqa as a symbol of we were the ones who beat ISIS, or uh, ne needless to say, the government will claim, the government of Bashar Assad will claim control of Raqqa because, again, it's a sovereign issue. There are some really complex legal issues that have to be sorted out. And does the U.S., for example, which is backed the movement, the, the Kurdish-dominated group, the Syrian Democratic Forces, with air power and with special forces on the ground, uh, does it back the Raqqa Council that is taking shape uh, of displaced people who want to go home and rule their own city? And does that set it up for a, a post-conflict conflict? conflict? Yeah, two thoughts on this. First of all, the notion of Iraqi sovereignty is being challenged by the emergence of a lot of non-state actors, uh, uh, militarized non-state actors uh, in various parts of Iraq. So, so this is something to be watched as well because it, it is going to be another driver of conflict in Iraq, even after liberation. Uh, the second thought I have is, uh, is a straight answer to the question. I think that the top priority, not only for the U.S., but for the rest of the international community, is to invest in a political process after liberation as much as they invested in the military effort. Mm -hmm. And when I say this, I always clarify, I'm not saying this, that they should do this because they need to do it for the people of the region. They need to do it because conflicts in the Middle East are a regional peace and international peace and security issue. It, it, address, it targets everyone. It's not only about the local... Uh, communities, local societies in, in the region. It is about uh, the whole international peace and security uh, framework. So this is where I see uh, that the international community has an interest uh, to invest in a political process that would avert further conflicts in the region. This issue always reminds me of the movie Charlie Wilson's War, mm -hmm. where the United States the Congressman uh, Charlie Wilson raised billions to f f uh, back the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Uh, but when it came to the post-Soviet era, he couldn't raise $5 million for education for Afghanistan. So there are a lot of challenges. We're always willing to back military operations, but we're not so good uh, on kind of post-conflict. Listen, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm really grateful to my colleagues, Eli Abu Aoun and Moni Akubian. And I hope you'll uh, join us again here sometime in the future.